Aquatic Ape Hypothesis, Wikipedia Article Audio The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis, also referred to as Aquatic Ape Theory and more recently the Waterside Model, is the idea that the ancestors of modern humans were more aquatic. The hypothesis in its present form was proposed by the marine biologist Alistair Hardy in 1960 who argued that a branch of apes was forced by competition from life in the trees to hunt for food such as shellfish on the seashore and that this explained many characteristics such as man's upright posture. This proposal was noticed by Elaine Morgan, a scriptwriter who objected to the male image of the mighty hunter being presented in popular anthropological works by Raymond Dart and others. While her 1972 book The Descent of Woman was very popular with the public, it attracted no attention from scientists, who saw no way of testing assertions about soft body parts and human habits in the distant past. Morgan removed the feminist polemic in several later books, and her ideas were discussed at a 1987 conference devoted to the idea. Her 1990 book Scars of Evolution received some favorable reviews, but the thesis was subject to scathing criticism from the anthropologist John Langdon in 1997 who characterized it as an umbrella hypothesis and argued that the hypothesis is not more parsimonious than simply rejecting the hypothesis. History The Hardy-Morgan Hypothesis Though much of the relevant mainstream academic community ignored or derided the proposal, a few academics in the last 15 years have conducted research at least in part inspired by AH. Scientists supportive of AH have published research that indicates that at some point in the last 5 million years humans became dependent on essential fatty acids and iodine, which are found in abundance in sea resources. Efficient function of the human brain requires these nutrients. The entirety of the aquatic ape proposal remains highly controversial, and is more popular with the lay public than with scientists. The German pathologist Max Wessenhofer discussed in 1942 various human characteristics that could have derived from an aquatic past, quoting several other authors who had made similar speculations. As he did not believe human beings were apes, he believed this might have been during the Cretaceous, contrary to what is possible given the geologic and evolutionary biology evidence available at the time. He stated, the postulation of an aquatic mode of life during an early stage of human evolution is a tenable hypothesis, for which further inquiry may produce additional supporting evidence. He later abandoned the concept. Independently of Wessenhofer's writings, the marine biologist Alistair Hardy had since 1930 also hypothesized that humans may have had ancestors more aquatic than previously imagined, although his work, unlike Wessenhofer's, was rooted in the Darwinian consensus. On the advice of his colleagues, Hardy delayed presenting the hypothesis for approximately 30 years. After he had become a respected academic and knighted for contributions to marine biology, Hardy finally voiced his thoughts in a speech to the British Sub-Aqua Club in Brighton on March 5, 1960. Several national newspapers reported sensational presentations of Hardy's ideas, which he countered by explaining them more fully in an article in New Scientist on March 17, 1960. My thesis is that a branch of this primitive ape stock was forced by competition from life in the trees to feed on the seashores and to hunt for food, shellfish, sea urchins etc., in the shallow waters off the coast. The idea was generally ignored by the scientific community after the article was published. Some interest was received, 
notably from the geographer Carl Sauer whose views on the role of the seashore in human evolution stimulated tremendous progress in the study of coastal and aquatic adaptations inside marine archaeology. In 1967, the hypothesis was mentioned in The Naked Ape, a popular book by the zoologist Desmond Morris, who reduced Hardy's phrase more aquatic ape-like ancestors to the bare aquatic ape, commenting that despite its most appealing indirect evidence, the aquatic theory lacks solid support. Reactions while traditional descriptions of savage existence identified three common sources of sustenance, gathering of fruit and nuts, fishing, and hunting, in the 1950s, the anthropologist Raymond Dart focused on hunting and gathering as the likely organizing concept of human society in prehistory, and hunting was the focus of the screenwriter Robert Ardrey's 1961 bestseller African Genesis. Another screenwriter, Elaine Morgan, responded to this focus in her 1972 Descent of Woman, which parroted the conventional picture of the Tarzan-like figure of the pre-hominid who came down from the trees, saw a grassland teeming with game, picked up a weapon and became a mighty hunter, and pictured a more peaceful scene of humans by the seashore. She took her lead from a section in Morris's 1967 book which referred to the possibility of an aquatic ape period in evolution, his name for the speculation by the biologist Alistair Hardy in 1960. When it aroused no interest in the academic community, she dropped the feminist polemic and wrote a series of books The Aquatic Ape, The Scars of Evolution, the Descent of the Child and the Aquatic Ape Hypothesis which explored the issues in more detail. Hardy's hypothesis as outlined in The New Scientist was Silence and Opposition Hardy argued a number of features of modern humans are characteristic of aquatic adaptations. He pointed to humans' lack of body hair as being analogous to the same lack seen in certain other marine mammals, such as the whale and the hippopotamus, and noted the layer of subcutaneous fat humans have that Hardy believed other apes lacked, although it has been shown that captive apes with ample access to food have levels of subcutaneous fat similar to humans. Additional features cited by Hardy include the location of the trachea in the throat rather than the nasal cavity, the human propensity for front-facing copulation, tears, and ecran sweating, though these claimed pieces of evidence have alternative evolutionary adaptationist explanations that do not invoke an aquatic context. Hardy additionally posited that bipedalism evolved first as an aid to waiting before becoming the usual means of human locomotion, and tool use evolved out of the use of rocks to crack open shellfish. These last arguments were cited by later proponents of awe as an inspiration for their research programs. Morgan summed up her take on the hypothesis in 2011. Academics who have commented on the aquatic ape hypothesis include categorical opponents who reject almost all of the claims related to the hypothesis. Other academics have argued that the rejection of Hardy and Morgan is partially unfair given that other explanations which suffer from similar problems are not so strongly opposed. A conference devoted to the subject was held at Valkenburg, Netherlands in 1987. Its 22 participants included academic proponents and opponents of the theory and several neutral observers headed by the anthropologist Vernon Reynolds of Oxford University. His summary at the end was Positive reactions as part of broader critiques of paleoanthropology Overall it will be clear that I do not think it would be correct to designate our early hominid ancestors as aquatic. But at the same time there does seem to be evidence that not only did they take to water from time to time but that the water was a habitat that provided enough extra food to count as an agency for selection.
Reactions of Hardy and Morgan The A has received little attention from mainstream anthropologists and paleoanthropologists. It is not accepted as empirically supported by the scholarly community, and has been met with significant skepticism. Related Academic and Independent Research In a 1997 critique, Anthropologist John Langdon considered the A under the heading of an umbrella hypothesis and argued that the difficulty of ever disproving such a thing meant that although the idea has the appearance of being a parsimonious explanation, it actually was no more powerful an explanation than the null hypothesis that human evolution is not particularly guided by interaction with bodies of water. Langdon argued that however popular the idea was with the public, the umbrella nature of the idea means that it cannot serve as a proper scientific hypothesis. Langdon also objected to Morgan's blanket opposition to the Savannah hypothesis which he took to be the collective discipline of paleoanthropology. He observed that some anthropologists had regarded the idea as not worth the trouble of a rebuttal. In addition, the evidence cited by A proponents mostly concerned developments in soft tissue anatomy and physiology, whilst paleoanthropologists rarely speculated on evolutionary development of anatomy beyond the musculoskeletal system and brain size as revealed in fossils. After a brief description of the issues under 26 different headings, he produced a summary critique of these with mainly negative judgments. His main conclusion was that the A was unlikely ever to be disproved on the basis of comparative anatomy, and that the one body of data that could potentially disprove it was the fossil record. Anthropologist John D. Hawkes wrote that it is fair to categorize the A as pseudoscience because of the social factors that inform it particularly the personality-led nature of the hypothesis and the unscientific approach of its adherents. Physical anthropologist Eugenie Scott has described the aquatic ape hypothesis as an instance of crank anthropology akin to other pseudoscientific ideas in anthropology such as alien-human interbreeding and Bigfoot. Waiting and Bipedalism In the Accidental Species Misunderstandings of Human Evolution, the nature editor Henry G. remarked on how a seafood diet can aid in the development of the human brain. He nevertheless criticized the awe because it's always a problem identifying features that humans have now and inferring that they must have had some adaptive value in the past. Also it's notoriously hard to infer habits from anatomical structures. Popular support for the A has become an embarrassment to some anthropologists who want to explore the effects of water on human evolution without engaging with the A, which they consider emphasizes adaptations to deep water conditions. Foley and Lahr suggest that to flirt with anything watery in paleoanthropology can be misinterpreted but argue there is little doubt that throughout our evolution we have made extensive use of terrestrial habitats adjacent to fresh water, since we are, like many other terrestrial mammals, a heavily water-dependent species. But they allege that under pressure from the mainstream, our supporters tended to flee from the core arguments of Hardy and Morgan towards a more generalized emphasis on fishy things. Paleoanthropologists Alice Roberts and Mark Maslin published a critique of the A in the I newspaper, which they also published online, dismissing it as a distraction from the emerging story of human evolution that is more interesting and complex, adding A has become a theory of everything that is simultaneously too extravagant and too simple. They were responding to two BBC radio documentaries on the Waterside Ape made by David Attenborough and aired in September 2016, in which consideration was given of a move towards mainstream acceptance for the awe in the light of new research findings. 
scientists interviewed about their research programs included Kathleen Stewart and Michael Crawford who had published papers in a special issue of the Journal of Human Evolution on the role of fresh water and marine resources in the evolution of the human diet, brain, and behavior. Philosopher Daniel Dennett, in his discussion of evolutionary philosophy, commented during the last few years, when I have found myself in the company of distinguished biologists, evolutionary theorists, paleoanthropologists and other experts, I have often asked them to tell me, please, exactly why Elaine Morgan must be wrong about the aquatic theory. I haven't yet had a reply worth mentioning, aside from those who admit, with a twinkle in their eyes, that they have also wondered the same thing. He challenged both Elaine Morgan and the scientific establishment in that both sides are indulging in adaptionist just-so stories. Along the same lines, historian Erica Lorraine Millam noted that independent of Morgan's work, certain standard explanations of human development in paleoanthropology have been roundly criticized for lacking evidence while being based on sexist assumptions. Anatomy lecturer Bruce Charlton gave Morgan's book Scars of Evolution an enthusiastic review in the British Medical Journal in 1991, calling it exceptionally well-written and a good piece of science. In 1995, Paleoanthropologist Philip Tobias declared that the savanna hypothesis was dead, because the open conditions did not exist when humanity's precursors stood upright and that therefore the conclusions of the Vogt-Enberg conference were no longer valid. Tobias praised Morgan's book Scars of Evolution as a remarkable book though he said that he did not agree with all of it. Tobias and his student further criticized the idea by arguing that the coming out of the forest of man's precursors had been an unexamined assumption of evolution since the days of Lamarck, and followed by Darwin, Wallace, and Haeckel, well before Raymond Dart used it. Food Sources, Nutrients, and Brain Size Alistair Hardy was astonished and mortified in 1960 when the National Sunday Papers carried banner headlines Oxford Professor Says Man a Sea Ape, causing problems with his Oxford colleagues. As he later said to his ex-pupil Desmond Morris, of course I then had to write an article to refute this saying no this is just a guess, a rough hypothesis, this isn't a proven fact. And of course we're not related to dolphins. Diving Behavior and Performance Elaine Morgan's 1972 book Descent of Woman became an international bestseller, a book of the month selection in the United States and was translated into ten languages. Part of this was related to the growing women's liberation movement as Morgan's work was inspired by a feminist critique of then-standard anthropological ideas. She assumed that the total lack of response to her book from the academic community was due to the fact that she was an outsider. The response I had not foreseen was total silence. But in respect of the aquatic theme that is what I got from them, and with few exceptions still get. That kind of silence is a virtually unbeatable strategy. Morgan removed the polemics and rewrote the scientific part publishing it as the aquatic ape ten years later, but it did not gain more acceptance from scientists. Although the general reaction to Hardy and Morgan's proposals was silenced by the relevant academic community, there have been over the last decades some academics who were inspired by a proposals, even to the point of pursuing particular lines of research on its basis. Some of the academics and professional scientists who have supported the AA include Michael Crawford, professor and director of the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition at Imperial College London, his former postdoctoral researcher, Stephen Cunnan, now Professor of Medicine at University de Sherbrooke, Erika Shigate, 
Professor of Environmental Physiology at Mid-Sweden University, and Kathleen M. Stewart, Section Head of Paleobiology at the Canadian Museum of Nature. After reviewing 30 different explanations of bipedalism, evolutionary biologist Karsten Niemitz proposed a shore-dweller hypothesis of waiting, though distancing himself from the awe. He records ten monkey and ape species, including chimpanzees and gorillas, who have been observed waiting on two feet. Niemitz's hypothesis places the waiting bipedalism of hominids as occurring in the late Miocene. Other researchers, including a proponent Algis Kuliukas, performed experiments to measure the comparative energy used when lacking orthograde posture with using fully upright posture. Although it is harder to walk upright with bent knees on land, this difference gradually diminishes as the depth of water increases and is still practical in thigh-high water. In a critique of the awe, uh, Henry G. questioned any link between bipedalism and diet. G. writes that early humans have been bipedal for five million years, but our ancestors' fondness for seafood emerged a mere 200,000 years ago. Bibliography In their 1989 book The Driving Force, Food, Evolution, and the Future, Michael Crawford together with CO author David Marsh wrote about the connections they saw between nutrition and human evolution, and in particular claimed that omega-3 fatty acids were vital for the development of the brain. A branch of the line of primitive ancestral apes was forced by competition to leave the trees and feed on the seashore. Searching for oysters, mussels, crabs, crayfish, and so on they would have spent much of their time in the water and an upright position would have come naturally. Crawford and Marsh argued that the norm of brain size seen in small and aquatic mammals is similar to humans and they further opine that other primates and carnivores had lost relative brain capacity. Reviewing their book for The New Scientist, biologists Caroline Pond and Dick Colby were highly critical, saying that the work provided no significant new information that would be of interest to biologists and that its style was speculative, theoretical, and in many places so imprecise as to be misleading. According to Crawford, the evolution of a large brain on the savannas of Africa was impossible. The only way it could have happened was with the resources of the marine food web which initiated the growth and development of the brain in the first place. A group of evolutionary nutritionists and paleontologists led by Cunnan, Stewart and Crawford published works arguing a correlation between aquatic diet and human brain evolution in their shore-based diet scenario acknowledging the Hardy-Morgan's thesis as a foundation work of their model. They describe problems in landlocked communities as being supportive of awe, with reports of Cretanism in the Alps since the 18th century and widespread goiters in parts of Africa, which is only prevented by the addition of iodine to diets. According to Cunnan, without the availability of iodized table salt, Non-coastal habitats do not provide foods rich enough to meet human iodine requirements. Evidence supports aquatic food consumption in Homo as early as the Pliocene but its linkage to brain evolution remains controversial. What has been lacking has been the paleontological evidence that early humans consumed fish in significant amounts earlier than tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago. Part of the problem has been the avoidance of taponymic bias by researchers. Most hominin fossils occur in marginal lacustrine environments and the presence of fish remains is therefore no proof of fish consumption. Fish bones often decompose so that special tests are required to detect them. The archaeological record of human fishing and coastal settlement is fundamentally flawed due to post-glacial sea level rise. Aside from working as a professor, Shigate is also an experienced scuba and freediver whose research centers around human diving abilities. 
she suggests that such abilities are consistent with selective pressure for underwater foraging during human evolution, and discussed other anatomical traits speculated as diving adaptations by Hardy slash Morgan. John Langdon suggested that such traits could be enabled by a human developmental plasticity.